Hi, I'm Dr. Kerry Gelb, and welcome to Open Your Eyes, your source for everything you want to know about eye care. The thing about flashes and floaters is they are two separate things, but they're related. So when you see flashes, that's any stimulation of the retina. So technically, you can stimulate a flash on your own by pushing against the side of your eye. Your eye will register that as a flash. So if you see flashes in your eye without digital stimulation or external stimulation, that means something is stimulating your retina from the inside. The reason a flash can be alarming is it can signal a retinal tear or detachment. It can mean that your retina is being stimulated because it's falling down, tearing, or being pulled on by the vitreous. That brings us to the floaters. The floaters exist within the vitreous. So it's hyaline tissue, it's areas where the floaters or where the vitreous has folded upon itself, and it's also something called a posterior vitreous detachment. They can all manifest themselves as floaters. In a nutshell, floaters are anything inside your eye that is casting a shadow on your retina that you perceive visually. Who's at risk for these? Why do some people get them? The people that are most at risk for them are people that are up higher in age. You'll tend to get more floaters and you'll get a condensing of that vitreous where the floaters form the older you get. However, if you're myopic, severely myopic, really nearsighted, have a longer axial length to your eye, you'll tend to get those sooner in life. In general, floaters are pretty benign. However, if you're seeing them, they can coincide with a retinal tear or detachment, so that does indicate getting an eye exam to make sure that there's no damage to your retina. Worst case scenario, what, what, is it, what could that lead to? Worst case scenario is that you have a retinal tear or detachment that precipitates a full detachment, which can lead to blindness. If that was going to occur, not only would you see the flashes, but you would begin to see what looks like a flapping curtain, a flag, or a veil rising up in your vision. Um, when do I see a doctor? You would see a doctor whenever you notice something new, in general, right? Um, but if you see new floaters, it's pretty common for people to have routine floaters, but if you see new ones that weren't there before, um, if you see flashes that weren't there before, um, or just flashes in general, it is a good time to get it checked out for preventative care. What a, so I go into my doctor, I come to Sexton, and what tests should I expect, what treatment, what, what's my heads up going? Right, right. In general, unless you've had a complete eye exam recently, you should expect to have a pretty complete eye exam. It may include dilation, it may include um, retinal imaging as well. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that we need to know about flashes and floaters? How could, could you avoid them? Could they go away? They can tend to go away with time. Um, sometimes your brain kind of shuts them off visually. Sometimes they move into a visual space that isn't nearly as active, off in the periphery or down low. Um, and they can be removed with surgery as well. However, the surgery is pretty invasive, so we usually leave that decision up to the retinal surgeon. They can tend to flare back up. Yeah, they'll, they'll reappear sometimes, um, especially in certain situations. If you are in a dark environment, all of a sudden you go into a very light environment, you'll tend to notice them more because that shadow casting will have a greater effect, yeah. In general terms, if anything causes kind of a visceral reaction of I think something's wrong, go see the doctor and get it checked out. Um, but if, again, if they're new floaters to you, if you haven't noticed this before, and it's something that you find visually disturbing, go see a doctor, definitely. <music> Is a form is a form of surgery that compensates for your glasses prescription refractive surgery so it's when um, essentially there's different forms of LASIK but in general a laser etches your prescription into your cornea or creates a compensating prescription to eliminate or correct your vision your refractive error your nearsighted and your farsightedness or your stigmatism by changing the shape of your cornea who should get it who can get it who can't get it there is a best candidate for LASIK. They are people with healthy corneas, no dry eye, no corneal disease, no sign of keratoconus, which is a thinning of the cornea. Um, and nearsighted people tend to have the best result. If you are farsighted, you can still get it, but the regression rate is higher, meaning the LASIK won't last quite as long. And what is that procedure? Walk me through it quickly. Uh, the procedure is a very quick procedure. Um, what generally happens is um, the eye is anesthetized, the eye is numbed up, um, you're laid back on a table, and they can either take a laser or a diamond cut blade to slice the top layer, the epithelium of the cornea off. The laser is then applied to the stroma, which is the middle layer of the cornea, okay? 
and they put your prescription in there, then the flap is laid back down. The reason a flap is used is the, the healing rate is significantly faster. And we're talking you heal in a matter of hours versus a matter of weeks. So is there like a... If I'm, if I'm going for LASIK surgery, is there a pre-op thing that I got to do? There is a pre-op. Yep, there, there is a pre-op because, um, because the surgery is permanent, they have to make sure the prescription is perfect. So they will have you do a refraction to determine your prescription, and then they'll do a, what's called a cycloplegic refraction where they put drops in your eyes to freeze your focusing mechanism in place to make sure you're not actively focusing through and, and creating a prescription that's incorrect. They'll also assess the corneal health, the front of your eye, where the operation is going to take place. They'll make sure your eye isn't too dry, isn't too thin, and can withstand the procedure and have you have a lifetime of healthy vision afterwards. So is it a day procedure, an hour procedure? The procedure itself usually takes 10 to 20 minutes. Um, you will need a driver to get home. You will not be able to drive yourself home. Both eyes are done at the same time. And your eyes will sting for probably three to four hours afterwards. Usually the surgeon will um, give you a mild sedative to calm you down and to help you sleep afterwards. And in terms of the longevity of the procedure? Is it so the longevity of the procedure is kind of varied. What LASIK does is it resets your prescription as close to zero as possible. It doesn't give you bionic vision by any means. But because you're human, your prescription may change over time. I kind of always say, even if you kept your prescription, throughout the years your prescription will continue to oscillate. It's just that LASIK will drop it down to zero, but it will continue to oscillate right there around zero. So you might get a little bit of astigmatism, which is distortion in your vision. You might get a little nearsightedness back, that type of thing, but it'll be much closer to zero. And ballpark cost and slashes insurance deal with it? The, there's, you, most LASIK carriers do have um, a discount. Most LASIK carriers also don't um, offer an insurance, the insurance doesn't cover LASIK. But if you do have an insurance plan, a lot of times they'll give you a similar discount around a $500 discount. Uh, depending on where you get it, it can be low, as low as $1,000 or as high as $3,500. Now the surgery itself is very routine, even though I have a rule of saying there's no such thing as a routine surgery. Um, but it's very well practiced, I guess I should say. It has very good standardized and concrete results. Um, however, there are complications that can happen in the surgery. There are complications that can happen after the surgery. But in general, the preoperative process and the preoperative exam are there to eliminate those issues. And once you have your LASIK, no, you don't buy contact lenses anymore? That's not necessarily true. If your prescription changes with time over the years, you may feel the need to A, wear glasses again. And if you don't want to wear glasses, you may want to switch to contact lenses. That being said, every patient, no matter who they are or what surgery they go through, We'll develop the need for reading glasses eventually, and if you would like that corrected with contact lenses, that would be your answer there. The interesting thing about contact lenses and contact lens exams is the procedure itself started out complicated, but then it got simple to a point where a contact lenses became a commodity. But now, as our needs as humans have increased and the complications have increased, and this is big push by the baby boomers as well, the need for multiple options for vision correction, dryness in the eyes, workplace stress, um, computer use, that has really pushed contact lenses into a territory where there is a lot of specialty care involved. Um, so contact lens exams these days are really tuned into your lifestyle and your needs making it so that your eyes and your vision are something that you don't need to worry or care about while correcting your vision fully and maintaining the health of your eyes at the same time. So in the exam, is, it, uh, is one of the first conversations cost and am I changing these every day, 15 days, you know, whatever the options are in terms of... I would actually say the first conversation is making the patient aware that they can wear contact lenses. In the past, as contact lenses became kind of a commodity, um, there was lim they were a commodity because they were simplified, there was limitations around the contact lenses themselves. Now contact lenses have become so specialized that people with disease processes, people who have abnormal corneas from after having LASIK or other surgeries, now can wear contact lenses. So the first conversation usually is making them aware of it. Um, and then the, the question about whether they're monthly or daily or two week or what type of modality you go into usually it's a lifestyle question. You have to fit the modality into their lifestyle, um, into their needs, and then the cost kind of comes in on the backside. The contact lens exam is much different 
than the than the annual exam or the normal exam. Um, in that the contact lens is a, exam is an extension, additional procedures that take place as you go through the exam uh, to establish the health of the cornea, how happy the cornea is going to be in the contact lens, the exact refraction or the exact correction that you need in your contact lenses, which is often much different uh, than your glasses exam. The thing with contact lenses these days as well is that contact lenses are no longer just for superficial visual correction. Um, there's a lot of therapy involved with contact lenses now. Um, scleral contact lenses are giving sight to people who have no option of correction with glasses, LASIK, with any other surgery. Um, what scleral lenses do is they're a large, hard lens that creates a new surface for them to look out of, giving them vision that they would never be able to have with any other device. Um, there are contact lenses also that treat and prevent nearsightedness, um, especially in young people and children. Um, it's a reverse geometry contact is what it's called. It reshapes the cornea and it gives children what appears to be a, a cornea that's had refractive surgery, but it is not a permanent procedure. It corrects their vision and it helps prevent them from becoming more nearsighted um, as they grow, um, which is kind of a new realm for contact lenses. And contact lenses are going to continue to expand in different directions, including medicinal uses, um, including medication injection into the eye, things like absorption into the eye. So I'll, I'll say that again. Um, contact lenses are going to continue to expand into different realms, including um, instilling medication in the eye through absorption through the contact lens. So how old does the child have to be before we can talk about wearing contact lenses? My answer to that is the child has to be mature enough to handle contact lenses. That can be as young as five years old, even younger. Um, and that can be all the way up into the teens if they're not mature enough to handle it. But that conversation revolves more around maturity and able to handle the contact lenses responsibly as opposed to age. Thank you for watching Open Your Eyes. Be sure to tune in for more informative episodes.